Hello there, today I'm going to talk about cheating like a pro, a few tools to get you pixeling and converting for C64. We're going to take a quick note about wiring, I'm going to talk about some tools that you can use, conversion mistakes that people keep making, and tricks to look smooth, what you can do to make a conversion look better, like palette fixing, dithering, and anti-aliasing. And then I'm going to deep do a deep dive into multi-paint, which is my tool of choice at the moment. Now the first question you always have to ask yourself when it comes to scene releases is wiring okay? Is it actually okay to take an outline from a font or a picture that you found somewhere else, scan it and convert it and do something with it? And the question of course is then it's like is this something that you created or is it something that you just converted? Is it art or is it craft? And I think the matter is that we have to consider here is like how much work it is and how much effort went into it. So at the beginning of the year, this got released from Bonsai. It was actually by Carrion, and it's again a picture of Eddie from uh, from Iron Maiden. There's a lot of those, like whole history of sensor sensor demos had Eddie's in there, and it looks pretty amazing. He's done he's done a really really good job with like the backpack. I love it there and the little details, and he used like sprite overlays, so you got the hand that feels like it, it's much more pixels than it could be in a normal multicolor picture. And it actually it got a lot of votes. People absolutely loved it. And then Carrion did something really cool. He actually released a video on Facebook where he actually showed us how he's done it. So he just grayscaled it, he did some dithering, then he started painting it with the C64 colors and made it look better. And he went into all the details of what he used, like he used Timantes and he changed the things around, he put it in the border. So there's lots of clever things going on there and a lot of effort being put into it. And in the end, it as I said, it got a lot of good votes and it was actually a really impressive piece of work. He also changed the picture a bit, so actually you can see the saber, for example, is not in there in the back, to make it fit. So the question now was like, is this still a graphics release? Is this something that you should be releasing to the scene? Because it's not an original. Of course it's not an original. It's just a cover by, uh, by Iron Maiden, an MLP cover. And he used Photoshop, he used Timantis, but he put a lot of extra work in. And I think it's totally okay to do that. I think rather than having no releases, it's actually good that we have some releases. The question is where you release it and how. So the, in this case, I think it's totally okay. Putting this into a competition at a party or some other competition, even one with price money, would I would be not okay, I think, because this is a matter of like showing what people can do, what people can paint with a certain computer, rather than what they just can convert from somewhere else. I mean, this has always been the case. All the good demos that we had out there have a lot of images that have been wired from something, sometimes even back in the days from Amiga to C64, and nowadays, of course, it's like, it's fair play. There's so many tools out there you don't actually know. That's why at competitions we normally ask for work stages where you can actually see how it came about. And I've seen people actually wire graphics and then create the work stages afterwards. So that's not a foolproof thing as well. The question then is, is wiring art or craft? Is it actually something that you create? Is it about the the art forum demo scene, or is it just a, a way to show how I can use technology to convert something for a C64 or for some other computer to work within these constraints of that one? And that's where the craft comes in. And I don't think that just being somebody who's very technical but not very creative is is something to be to be just not taken serious as well. It's it's a lot of work going into it, and you have to learn a lot about like what the C64 can do and what your tools can do to make it work to look good. So I think it's totally valid to have some, something converted. But my problem that I see a lot these days is that a lot of wired stuff just looks shoddy. It's just people wired it quickly and put it out there and then want to get applause for it, although they didn't do the littlest effort just to make it look good. Because there's a lot of steps in C64 graphics, a lot of craft, a lot of way, way to work that actually make it look better. And these are simple to do, but sometimes people seem to be too lazy or not knowing about them. So that's why I want in this talk to be reminding people about what they could do as a second step once they started converting things. Carrion has shown that in his video quite well as well. He's done a lot of extra work to make it work. The craft was really, really big in that one. And I'm not criticizing him here. I think this was a really cool release. And props to him to actually show the how-to video as well, because that's how we teach the next people that come into the scene what they can do in the near future. So the tools that I'm going to talk about today are the ones that I'm using most of the time that are multi-platform and they're free. 
I mean, there's a lot of tools that are only for Windows, and uh, I'm using a Mac, so sometimes I cannot use them. A lot of really cool ones like Charpad and SpritePad and these kind of things. So I have a Windows machine as well, so I keep jumping between the two. But these tools that I'm covering here are for all platforms and actually should be working for all of you out there, regardless of what you're using. So the first one I want to talk about is Convertron 3000, which is just such a great Futurama-like title, and I love it to bits. It's by Fisa Wolf, a biz connection. And it's a great thing because it's just a conversion tool. It's not a pixeling tool. It's just for you to convert graphics onto the C64. And you can see there's lots of stuff that you can do. You can have the dithering set to the order at Floyd Steinberg. You can have the different C64 palettes. You have color modifiers for saturation, brightness, contrast, and so on. And you can you can generate Koala and Hyrus pictures. My favorite, and we're going to come back to that later as well, is that it has brightness palettes so that it only doesn't only uh, convert the luminosity of the colors to 664 colors, but allows you to pick from one of the clever palettes that we done over the years that collected the, the colors in the way they wanted to. So it's a really nice little tool just to get a conversion going. And I wouldn't just use it nilly willy, just like the final product here is not good enough for releasing, but it's a great thing to get some background images or some things converted that you want to use later. One thing that I don't like about it is only has a, a KOA output, so Koala Paint output. I would love to be able to save it as a PNG again. I mean, I have a script for that one to save it as a PNG, that's fine. But I think it makes not much sense to actually convert only to Koala and not back to PNG or other formats so you can use other tools uh, after this one. One thing uh, the same person actually has created is called Dithery Do, and that already gives extra points for the great name of that one. And the demo picture he used here is a great homage by Mirage. It's just this is insane. This is just such a wonderful picture. Mirage, uh, together with like Mermaid and Facet and Sander and Joe. There's so many people out there that are just absolute magic when, when it comes to the dithering and the colors. And you look at that and you think this can't be C64, but it's actually all valid C64 colors. And even some of the color changes here that he used, I wouldn't normally use, but it just is beautifully done. Okay, back to the to, back to the tool. The tool has a great granular 8x8 control, so it's actually great for developers as well because you can define for each char what it's going to be, what the block does, uh, and uh, with what you want to do with replacing and changing. So it's a great thing to optimize three colored uh, pictures, for example, as well. It has dither brushes that actually allows you to pencil with them. But it has no zoom, and that's something I keep using. I keep zooming into it and, and going directly on the pixel level, mostly because I probably can't see good enough anymore. But it has also no tools, no line, circle, etc., et no copy and pasting. It's very much just like having a brush and going char by char. So it's, it's a nice tool to get into the granular things, and if you want to optimize something, it's not something that I actually would start painting in right now, and probably this will go better as well. It's open source, it's on GitHub, and it's lovely that he rolled it out there. Retro Pixels is an interesting one. I just uh, stumbled on that on some Facebook group. That's an NPM CLI tool, so it's actually a JavaScript tool for, for Node.js on the server. And it supports PNG, Koala, Sprites, FLI, and AFLI. And it has a dither and palette control, and that's pretty cool. You have like command line switches to say which dithering it should choose to use and which palette it should use, and if it should output as an F as a flea, as an A flea, or sprites and koala or PNG. So this is something that could you could you could use for batch converting or for doing something like you remember that C64 yourself that was around years ago where you can actually have your webcam turn into a C64 picture. This would be much better than that because the outcome is quite impressive. It's by Michael Debray and and there's great blog post out there. By the way, all the things I'm talking about are going to be at the end. There's going to be a link that you can look at and use for, for later on, so you don't need to note those down right now. MacDraw is something I just stumbled upon last week or something, and it blew me away. It's absolutely amazing. It's actually a pixel editor in the browser, so it's actually not to be installed, not to be downloaded at all. It has Koala and PNG support. It validates for color clashes, so it shows you in red where there's color problems, because you know for every character in multicolor you have like three colors in one background color. So if you're trying to get one more, you see where the problems are. And has dither brushes of all kinds of sorts. And what is really impressive as well, it has a preview in Vice. So it actually uses Emscripten uh, and WebAssembly to run Vice inside the browser. So you can actually see what it looks like in the emulator. I'm not quite sure actually how that's useful because in essence, the color of the emulator is the same palette as the editor. But it's really impressive that you can do that in the browser nowadays and you can actually, 
I don't know, you could put you could put it to another tool inside Vice or whatever. But I think it's a really interesting thing that it all runs in the browser. It's right now has a few bugs in Zoom. They're aware of that as well. And I will take a look at it and maybe I can contribute to the code as well because that's another thing. It actually is available for you out there. And I love that, again, something like that in the browser years ago wouldn't have been possible. But nowadays we got all these cool mscripten and stuff to run in the browser that we can put code that we've written in other languages inside the browser without having to rewrite it. Multipane is my weapon of choice right now. I'm using that for almost everything, and it's impressive what it can do. The best thing about it is it has lots of platforms. So you have like C64 Hi-Res, Multicolor, the C64 Hi-Res 3, which is the new mode where you have Hi-Res, uh, but you have uh, not only two colors per, per char, I don't know right now what it does. Just it's like multicolor and high res, in high res resolution. You also can do ZX Spectrum, MSX, Plus 4, Amstrad, and so on and so forth. And for each of these sections, for each of these modes, when you turn it on, it knows the limitations of the platform and only allows you to pixel in that mode. And that's pretty impressive to actually know these modes as well without having to have the hardware or an emulator to test it on. It's got PNG and bin support. It also uh, exports Koala and exports uh, PRG files, so executables if you wanted to. It validates the color clash per uh, uh, char, so you don't only have the problem that you paint something and then you have to validate it. You actually know why you're pixeling that you're doing something wrong. It has dithers preset once. It has snap to char with the color mode, and it has a play brush for sprites. I'm not going to show that today, but it's actually really useful. You can when you just do two rectangles of 24 by 21 pixels and do them on both sides of the screen, any of the three chars in the middle are becoming sprites. And the, the cursor that you have will be the animation of those sprites. So it's really cool to do like little uh, sprite animations without to having to use an extra sprite tool, like for example, Sprite Mate, which is also available in the browser. This one is actually a bit resource hungry. That's the only problem that I have with it. So it needs Java to be installed first. It's actually written in processing. Uh, but I found that on my older Mac, it actually was uh, very prone to start the fan going. And I was kind of like annoying about it. But on the other hand, I just, it, there's so many cool things in there. And I love that Dr. Tara Z, who's actually creating that one, also does all the graphics. So he has a lot of cool demo graphics in there showing what it can do. So. These are the tools that are available for you nowadays, just some of them. There's Timantis as well. There's, uh, I, I'm not going to go into that. There's like 400 of them by now. I've, I've written a few. Other people have done some. But these are the ones that I'm using because they're multi-platform and they actually get me where I want to go. Now, when it comes to conversion mistakes, I think the biggest problem is that people don't assume these tools do a lot of cool stuff for them. And if they're not really aware of the limitations of a C64, they're going to build things that look great on a screen, on a, on a big screen like this one, but on in an emulator or on the C64 itself, it would be, abs would be looking absolutely horrible. Or for someone like me who actually knows about graphics and loves graphics and has been doing that for a long time, you just see these little things sometimes in there that are just off and they're not the right thing to do and it just shows that somebody just converted and hoped for the best and and said like okay cool i'm done i want to do something else it, again it's fine if you just want to release something but just putting a bit more craft into it i think is paying a lot more respect of what we've done over the years and how we went to make the demo scene what it is right now i mean Taking a conversion and putting them into a competition is just paying no respect to the people that are actually going in there as well. Some people have spent a lot of time, a lot of effort making something unique, something new, pixeling something by hand, and then uh, somebody else wins with something that we've seen before just because it's a monster and a half-naked lady. And sadly enough, I've seen far too many competitions that happened like that. And I want people to be rewarded for their work, and I want people to respect the effort that other people make as well, and not just take the limelight away from them with something that they released in three minutes. So the biggest mistakes I think that people make is relying on rescaling. Often you see images that are in JPEG format and all kinds of sizes, and people resize them just to, to uh, in the editor. Like multi-paint, for example, you can open anything and it will try to shrink it to 320 by 200 or cut the most important part out of it, and it never really works. It always looks like it's wrong aspect ratio or there's some pixels off. It never, it never really looks good. So if you want to use something 
something else, if you want to use Photoshop or something else, start with 300 by 320 by 200 pixels or multiples. I, most of the time I start with the 640 by 480 so I can actually do some uh, downsampling later on and I can still have something that is not completely in my face in my Photoshop or actually I use Photop in the browser as well. The other thing is, of course, make the thing bigger. Like with the new browser, uh, uh, with the new demo systems that we have, it's become very common to have like multi, uh, multi screen logos. And a lot of people are just basically just trying to woo the audience in demos with like making a huge picture that scrolls and is really like not that optimized and actually not my, hasn't got much pixel love and much effort. It's just like, oh, look what I can do, what I can fit into the memory. And most of the time, it's just some system that came out of a demo system that somebody else coded, which of course they give credit to. That's fine as well. But just because something is like five screens doesn't make it a, a really good uh, C64 graphic. Sometimes just one thing and a little thing and a little animation is so much work and so much beautiful details that it actually wows the audience and wows people that look at your demos as well. We don't always have to go for the like technical super sizing that actually impresses people. The same thing is that people rely on A flee, U flee, I flee to bring magic. Like uh, I've seen far too many images that were just like I fly and flickering away, and especially in an emulator, almost not possible to look at on a real 64 c64 ifli when it came out was amazing it was just beautiful but it was always hard to actually pixel it by hand because it actually not making it really flicker was something that you really had to know what to do a lot of people nowadays just convert something from from millions of image millions of colors to an ifli and then like oh it looks good because people it's ifli it's something amazing not necessarily. I love high res. I love multicolor. If you see what somebody like Mermaid can do with just multicolor pictures, it's just ridiculously be uh, beautiful. And you don't always have to show that get used to coolest functionality. I always like the limitations of C64 graphics. We're working in an environment that's very limited. So just making it uh, do something that it shouldn't just by streaming a video into it or something is to me a nice technical exercise, but it doesn't have much to do with art. It doesn't have much to do with craft either to me. So starting with a full color image is actually something that a lot of people do wrong as well. And most of the time it's even worse when they use a JPEG. Because JPEG, uh, the JPEG compression is using triangles to put the image together. That's why I got all these artifacts and these blurry things when you actually go down to 10%, 20% quality of a JPEG. So JPEG doesn't give you pixels, it gives you smudges. Whereas like a, a GIF or a PNG, just always has pixels and you can do something with them directly as well. I'm writing a lot of tools using Canvas in the browser and with a PNG I know the, with what pixel is one pixel and I can actually uh, apply a palette to it. Whereas like with a JPEG I have all these smudges in there that I first have to clean up before I do something with. So if you want to convert something try to get a clean pixelized image first to actually do it or do it like uh, carry on did and, and grayscale it and do something like that way. So um, let me let me go through something that that I'm gonna do a run through later on in multi in multi paint uh, to convert this one to a C64 version. So this is something that I use in Photopea in the browser and any editor that we can have right now. That's a two minute project or one minute project even. You just take a font, you write transmission, you put like a. a, a an outline on it, you put a gradient overlay on it, you put 64 behind it, fill that one, and you're done. And the problem is like when you save this now as a 256 pixel, a 256 color PNG, and you import it into multipane, this is what you get. And this is actually a mess. This is quite, uh, you see where the all the 8x8 uh, uh, rectangles are? That's where basically Multipaint gave up and said, like, I don't know which one is the one of the three colors here. So I'm just putting that in there as an error. So you have to fix it by hand. And if you zoom into that one uh, more detailed, then you see that actually Multipaint did as best it could, but it actually just uh, put pixels everywhere. There's like gray, red, uh, there's, there's orange, brown, and red pixels for the for the anti-aliasing around the light red ones and it's all over the place so you don't really know how to clean that out. So when you're actually using something like this, like in this case Photopea here, 
bump the quality down to as much as needed. So this was even a, a screenshot before I did the final one. In the end, I used a 1% quality because I only wanted to have like four, pick, uh, four colors in there. And the gradients and all the cool things that you want to have, I think makes much more sense to do in the editor itself rather than having the editor converted for you because the dithering and the stuff that you want to have will never be the way like you can do it in the editor because you have full control in there. So this one now looks like this, and that's actually a good start to get started with converting something to a C64 image because there's not many pixels off anymore. We only have the orange right now around the yellow. We have a few light grays in there that are not in place, but it's nothing that we cannot fix if with a little bit of effort and don't release it like that. I've seen demos come out like, like this right now. This is just, again, just being sloppy and just showing off like, look, I can make a demo. And you're like, well, it's kind of an art form, it's kind of a craft form. Please pay some tribute to people who put a lot of effort into it as well. You can see the, the anti-aliasing on the light gray stuff is actually quite okay. But I think when I start with it, I normally try to undo all the things that the automated importing has done for me. Because it's kind of easier to set a few good looking pixels than to find all the wrong ones. And I've done that before as well, where I converted something and then ended up like having to trace down all the errors that are in there. And I always one or two pixels missing, especially when you do like a three color conversion, when you convert it to a char set later on or to sprites, you will always find there's like one or two problematic ones in there that the coder that I sent this stuff to then had to fix by hand anymore. So making sure that you clean it out before you actually get started is probably a better way of getting started than just trying to fix every problem that the automated conversion put in there. Now, there's a few tricks to look smooth on Commodore 64 and um, any platform that is like very limited to a degree. And uh, let's go through them bit by bit. The first one is fixing the palette. The, uh, the color palette of C64, the 16 colors that we have, and there is different gray scales or different shades of brightness palettes that actually look great together. This can be different from, uh, uh, from palette to palette in editors. And also in old 664s, I remember there were some where like dark gray was darker than brown. So some pictures of, uh, of designers back then that I saw look completely off on mine, but on their computer, it looked actually great. And the problem is most conversion tools just use the luminosity of the or the brightness of the pixel and then assign one of the C64 colors to it. And that's sometimes uh, problematic because a few of them are so close to each other that the conversion, unless it's done well, the conversion algorithm is done well, will just use them uh, uh, interchangeably and it doesn't work. Because C64 luminosity is a very complex matter. There's like lots of research about like why the VIC chip did it something, what the CTC-128 did, and there's lots of like uh, great discussions about what's the best palette and so on. Um, I'm always out of these discussions, but it's interesting to see how far down the rabbit hole people go. And this is why badly converted images, we use mid-gray, light red, and light blue interchangeably which is interesting because remember I talked about a Mirage picture earlier that did that. But most of the time when you just see them next to each other without any interchanges or no dithering, it just looks smudged and it looks dirty. And you can see from the first look as somebody who knows about pixeling that somebody just converted that and didn't quite care about fixing it later on. And it often this means out cleaning out lots of weird looking pixels for you. It's something that you, and that's not fun to do. Cleaning up things is kind of feeling like, undoing things that have been done for you and I think tools should be doing things for us so we can build on top of that rather than having to clean out all of it. An interesting one here is Dithery Do, as I talked about before it has these brightness palettes that actually allows you to change the color to a certain palette so in this case it just did a conversion but you can say brown, green, gray, blue, uh, green and custom. Custom is you have to define first. But this is pretty amazing because it actually allows you to convert images to the palette that will be supported by C64 and not some of them that look next to each other and look quite okay in that preview, but on a real 64 would look absolutely terrible. So the uh, Convertron 3000 is the only one I know that actually does that right now. And I think it's a pretty clever idea to actually uh, include that into any graphics tools. Now, dithering is to me the art of faking more colors. We've got 16 colors, but by dithering them, like for example with that checkerboard pattern here, we can give the impression like we have more colors. Our eyes are lazy and our eyes actually want, they, they, crave, uh, uh, they crave harmony. 
So by, by putting two colors of, uh, on top of each other, we see them as a third color. And if you just squint your eyes, it actually gets even better. We used that in the past in some demos as a, as a joke. Remember, blah, blah from Sensor, where it actually asks you to put a white sheet on top of the monitor so it looks more blurry. And because the animation looked quite blocky, so that was one of the things there. And now there's lots of dither patterns. The most common one is the, um, is the checker. Board, just like having one 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 off one one off but there's others like I just showed in here right now that there's all kind of pattern uh, dithering patterns that you can do and depending on how you use them you can simulate lots of different colors by mixing two close colors with, with each other and sometimes even like really grating like white pixels on a red background can look great like old uh, game graphics for example kept using that so there's no no one one rule for them all but it's a very simple way to simulate like that there's more colors in the C64 than there are. And uh, it's sometimes a good idea to stop to mix those different patterns as well and not just stick with one of them. Because uh, you can do amazing things with it. This is from Project Argon by Rexbang from 2013. It was like the three color uh, competition, three color competition, logo competition. And this is three colors. This is really only three colors in that whole image. And it looks like it's like 16, 17, just by using very clever dithering on top of other things. And it was just, I looked at that and I'm like, this can't be. So I actually looked at it in detail, but it's an amazing way of actually showing how dithering can give you, can give you colors that you haven't even thought of before. And sometimes it's like mixing, for example, red and brown, uh, red and blue gives you this, weird purple as well. So there's wonderful color mixes, mixes that you can do just by using the right dithering. And I was really blown away by that one. I think it's also important to not overdo it with the dithering because you can actually, you can make things look very smooth and too smooth. And when they look too smooth, then the first result will always be that somebody says this looks far too wired. And uh, this is actually, this was wired to a degree. Yeah, I just did the outlines again in Photopy and the rest I basically pixeled then uh, by hand. This was even before I actually knew a lot about uh, multi-paint, so I did a lot of extra hand-by-hand -hand pixeling here rather than doing, using the things that multi-paint gives me that I'm going to show you in a second. But, I mean, he's right. This looks too smooth. This looks like something that was just a conversion and then worked up a bit. So not, own, not always overdoing it, with the, especially with the checkerboard dithering, is sometimes a good idea to make things look much more natural. Although that was not a problem because the people I did it for actually released it like this without telling me because they needed it in three colors and didn't tell me up front that this is actually a three color. So I was, I was livid. This is actually really, really destroying what I've done here because this looks really horrible. But then again, it was the last one that they did and I'm, I'm okay with it by now. It's just a matter of like... If you ask a graphician to do something for you, tell him about the limits or tell her about the limits that you want to use this thing so you don't have to do that kind of extra step that just makes everybody unhappy in this case. Now, anti-aliasing is the next trick, and that's the art of making pixels disappear. So in essence, what you do is you put a darker color at the end of a lighter color and make sure that you don't see the pixel boundaries. I mean, this is an interesting one because we always work like that on C64. We want to make sure you can't see all the pixels. We want to you want to make it smooth. We did it the way we give anti-aliasing so everything looks cool and smooth. And then the whole like new thing right now of the researchers of pixel art is that every pixel has to be visible, whereas we spend a lot of time ma not making them look like that. A lot of the retro pixel stuff as well doesn't understand that back then we didn't have the monitors we have right now, so these pixels were never seen as pixels. They were seen as blotchy things that. That actually merged into a Dara and like depending on the TV set that you had they still uh, they still showed up while they were gone so you had some kind of onion skinning just by moving things around but this is the way you actually do dithering you get like a lighter color and then a darker color and I always I always do like when there's two pixels I do one lighter and a darker one and when there's one pixel I just do a single color and that way it actually looks quite smooth the way it's supposed to do, or the way it's supposed to do in old school people like me who like to who like to hide the pixels rather than show the pixels. And this has been around for ages. There's a very interesting thing that again our eyes and our brain crave harmony. So if you put two colors next to each other, it sees it as a smooth thing rather than just two pixels next to each other. We we get like a bit of this blurry thing going, and that makes it more pretty. 
Now let's deep dive into Multipaint, what the Multipaint tool can do for you that I find really exciting in terms of C64 limitations and also building things for the C64. So the first thing I really love about it, and that's almost every tool has that, but uh, in the past it wasn't like that, it has actually a char grid and a snap to grid. So this means you when, you, when you start painting, you can turn on the char grid, so you know the limits of which char can have three colors in between. And if you do the, uh, the snap to grid, everything that you paint will be in 8 by 8 pixels. So this is great for copying and pasting. This is great for covering things. You will never be having one just one pixel off if you want to convert it to chars or to sprites later on. You have to think in chars anyway. So these two tools make it easier to actually have things to copy and paste on the screen that will never have a color clash because you're copying whole chars and uh, color RAM rather than just pixels on the screen. The recoloring mode is something that took me a while to find and it, it is documented, it's somewhere in the docs and I did, uh, I spent a lot of stupid time uh, repixeling char by char. So what you do with that one is you take the color you want to you want to replace with the right hand mouse and the color you want to replace it with with the left hand mouse and then you can use any of the tools in the palette after turning on the uh, the recoloring mode and that will in each of the chars then change color change this color to the other color and so on. So in this case I now changed the the, the red to green and now the light gray to uh, to cyan. And the cyan right now up there uh, above the transmission here is wrong as well, but that's something I would need to fix later on. But you can see this is really, really easy to recolor parts of it. So sometimes I do a, a thing in just grayscale, and then I recolor it using that mode later on. And again, as you do it by char, you don't have any color clash problems there. It's a very simple way to get, that, get started with that one. Selections are brushes, and that's a really cool thing in uh, Multipaint as well. So you can select part of the screen, and then you can use it as a brush and paint with it. And you can also color it, and you can rotate it, and you can mirror it. So in this case right now, I'm selecting the whole logo as a brush. Again, I, I, I snap to the char here to make sure I don't create color clashes. And now I could move it around on the screen anywhere I want. And actually, it will fix the color clashes once I put it there. I can also flip it around. And I can flip it horizontally and vertically. And that's, of course, great for painting char sets. I can also rotate it 90 degrees. But uh, in multicolor mode in C64 with the 2 by 1 pixel ratio, that always looks awful. So that's a very bad idea. But for high res, I sometimes used it. I didn't use it in the screencast here right now, but the, uh, the, the, the button next to it, that color blob here, that is actually turning the, uh, the brush into one color. So that's also another way to get rid of unnecessary colors from a conversion if you wanted to. And I think this is one of the most powerful things that Multipaint has. It's wonderful to use. Dither brushes and priorities as well. You have a dither menu down at the bottom here, and if you right-click on that one, you can select from all the dithers that it has preset as well. And these are the ones that I showed in the dither example earlier. And the interesting thing with that one is that you can just start painting a little like a, a color a color run here. So in this case, I'm now using orange to a green, and from a green to a yellow to a cyan. And then I can use the dither brushes to start mixing these colors a bit. Whoops. So in this case, now it goes to the cyan, then it goes to the yellow. And now I start uh, turning on the dither brush. And I use the same brush that I'm using right now, except now I'm uh, using a dither to actually mix the two colors like this. And this is quite, this was pixel by pixel in all the other editors on C64. And it's always annoying. One thing I don't like here, it, does, it only does it in one, one direction. Other editors also allow you to invert the dither, so you can actually do it in the other side. This is not there in Multipaint yet. But here's interesting, if you just move something around, it would cover it. But if you change the background, uh, the color that it's painted into the background, then you can actually just use this to cut out something from a dither. And this is a very cool way to actually overlay things again in a char set or something. So you paint the dither background and use your outline in one color and then just overlay it that way. So that's a very simple way to get that done, which is something that uh, in the past was harder to do. So if you now go through that, let's take a look at how I've done that logo bit by bit. So um, the first thing I'm doing is actually replace the orange with a yellow and then with a the black to realize, okay, this is what I want to do. Same, I got rid of all the other ones, and then I start cleaning out the outlines. This is basically just 
uh, counting pixels. So you do like one 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 two 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 three 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 and so on and so forth. And it actually looks much smoother that way because a conversion normally goes in between half pixels. So in this way, I just cleaned out the uh, uh, the the extra pixels that are in there and made everything look a bit smoother. This is something that over time you learn how to do. One main thing to remember is like never leave a single pixel there. There's like single pixels always look awful without any dithering around it, and it's a bad idea to do it that way. So once I've done that, I now got these ways as a, as a one color. And then I can use, for example, the dither brushes here to paint a dither uh, outline. So in this case, I now fill it. I use the dither brush and I put a bit of dithering around it. And then I can uh, I copied the image to the other uh, the other screen. And now I use the uh, the color and background chosen right now to overlay this one to make to put the um, to put the dither in uh, fill in the outline that I had before. So this is something I didn't have to do by hand. And now it's actually by hand putting all the uh, the anti-aliasing on it. And it's also a very good way because you also see the color clashes happening as well. So you know which ones are the chars that might be problematic. This looks tedious, but I actually find it kind of a Zen moment. You know, other people have like their bonsais or just uh, brush something. I think this is like doing a puzzle and it's actually fun to do. Uh, this is not sped up. This is actually how I work. No, it's it's really sped up. So the the real video is forty five minutes and it's actually on YouTube as well and it's gonna be in the links later on as well. So here I then just do the fills. I choose another dither brush. Uh, this time just a, uh, a, a horizontal one, and I keep outside. I paint outside here because again I'm using the sixty four now as the overlay and using that background color uh, trick to actually fill that out. I now uh, only add some extra ones. I try to do some white, but I realized there's too many clashes, so that didn't work. And I also put some extra pixels around the just the horizontal one to make it look a bit better. I then do anti-aliasing again to all the outlines here, and that one makes them look much, much smoother than they did before. Don't know why I'm actually undoing that. No, it's actually I'm in the four right now, that's why. And yeah, that's I repeated that with all of them. When I do anti-aliasing, I normally start with the lightest to the darkest as well. So that way I find out about color clashes quite simply as well. And once I've done with that, it actually looks quite smooth. It does the job. It's not an amazing logo, of course. It's, uh, it's something that you can just do in a demo as a Lotus Green or something like that. It's, again, nothing that actually I'm super proud of. I think it's just to show how easy it is to put some extra effort in to make something look a lot smoother than it would be before. And this is the final version here right now. And I see this right now and I'm already realizing I'm missing out a lot of stuff. Like there's a few pixels that need fixing. It's just a, a crude little approach right now to show you what you can do with a few dither brushes with a bit of anti-aliasing to make links, uh, things look much smoother than they did before in the normal conversion. Now, if you don't find something that the, these tools can do, I actually started building my own tools as well. Of course, that's not for everybody, but I think it's quite fun what you can do just with a bit of JavaScript in the browser nowadays. For example, one thing I did is a C64 color changer. That's a very simple, simple tool to just drag an image into it and change one color to another. I keep doing that in like logo galleries when people post logos with an absolutely horrible palette and I just load them in there, change the colors around, save them back. And so like this is what it actually was meant to look like. And this is just running in the browser and uh, quite intuitively to be done. Another one I've done that I use all for all the headings in this uh, this slide deck here as well as logo omatic. So that's something that I have a lot of fun doing, and I realized a few bucks right now while I was doing that as well. So that one allows you to just generate logos from old C64 and a few Amiga fonts uh, that I ripped from demos, and most of them I fixed it myself as well, where you can actually create logos. Uh, these are not to the specifications. So if you created this one right now and loaded it into C64, you would have a lot of color clashes because I'm not sticking to the 8x8 grid, but I'm thinking about putting that in, in the near future as well. Another one that I did was tile edit because uh, none of the tools that I saw had good tiling. So this one is now just a little editor that allows you to pixel things and you can see in the background what it would look like as a tile. And I did that for a few of the rotating things we did in Padua in the last demos. I just wanted to build, build it myself. So in summary, art is hard. 
I mean, doing real art is a lot of effort and it's just beautiful what people do out there. So I think it's important that we understand that some people are artists out there. Other people like me are borderline artists. They're just like good in the craft of making things look smooth and actually find ways to actually uh, uh, make them look amazing if you do it the right way. But craft to me is knowledge and repetition. So if you're looking at this right now and you're like, oh, I could never do this, it's just the more you do it, the easier it will get. And that's something to never forget that just by doing it more and more, you will actually be able to create something quite cool in a short amount of time. And using powerful tools is okay. I think it's fine if you start in a Photoshop or somewhere else. It's just a matter of where you release it later on. Like selling other people's work as yours is less so okay. I think it's not like, I mean, if Carrion had said like, oh, I came up with that Eddie, I mean, nobody would have taken it serious. That's a very obvious one. But I've seen it in the past as well that people created obviously wired things and then tried to sell it off as something they did by hand. And I think that's just... Uh, Pathetic. It really makes no sense. This is fun. The demo scene is fun. We're not doing this for money. We're not doing this for uh, for fame in, in like the common sense. It's just a thing that we should have fun with. So so if somebody takes uh, puts a lot of effort in and somebody else wins a competition with something that was done in three minutes, that's just not nice to people. And a bit more effort yields great results. Do a bit of dithering, do a bit of anti-aliasing, and all of a sudden your thing looks much smoother than it did before. And there are a lot of channels out there talking about pixel goodness. Come and take a look. So in the, in the resources for this talk, I have a lot of Facebook groups that I'm also part of, where we have a lot of great discussions about what is art, what is craft, should Wired be a thing. But I think today I hope you learned something and you got a bit of like excitement to use any of these tools to get painted get painting and get pixeling and I think some of them are just in the browser you don't need to install anything so it's wonderful that we live in this world where tooling has come that far so go forth and pixel at tinyurl c64 conversion or at that QR code right now you can see all the things that I talked about the slide deck is there as well and the videos of the fast speed run as well are out on YouTube and I'm Cupid from Pardo and the Solution. And now let's go back and look at some of the things that people send in for the graphics competition.